So it, it's so great to be here. Uh, it's so great to uh, be able to address you guys for uh, almost an hour. Uh, it's a huge challenge uh, to follow Eddie Greller. Um, see what I can do. I had a big challenge yesterday. Some of you know maybe Jensen Huang, who's the CEO of NVIDIA. I had the privilege to give a talk after him. So this is the week of challenges. First Jensen yesterday and today Eddie. All right, we'll see how it goes. Okay, my title is Explore Nation. Uh, and my goal here today is to uh, uh, make you chant Explore Nation uh, when, you, when you leave. So, but as a starting point, let me just say a few words about where I'm from, because the whole concept sort of depends a little bit on, on the setup that I have back home in, in Sweden. It's the, the Norrköping Visualization Center in the county of Östergötland, and I challenge you to pronounce all of those umlauts correctly and the sh sounds. Okay, so here it is. Uh, it's, it's a center that I've spent 30 years of my life trying to build, uh, and it contains fundamental research uh, in graphics, visualization, uh, data science, uh, high-performance computing. Um, but what we have also done is that we have connected that with a huge public outreach facility. Uh, so it, as an integrated part of the center, we are bringing in the general public. And we have about uh, 200,000 visitors per year coming through. So it's pretty cool for a university professor to be able to say, hey, you know, I have 200,000 visitors in my lab every year. Most of them are kids. And that's pretty cool, right? Uh, but we have lots of other things, about 200 people working in, in the environment. So here, the, the research groups that are there, spanning everything from basic graphics. You know, I, we talked about fake things before. If you've seen the IKEA catalog, um, it's all fake uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, photorealistic stuff that my uh, dear colleague Jonas Unger has been working with in our graphics group. And we do a lot of, lot of stuff all over the whole domain. But one of the groups that I think is most important that you will hear about today is this one that we actually have embedded a group that studies visual learning and communication. From a pedagogical didactics point of view, how can I use visual media to communicate to the general public? And how can I bridge that gap between the research and a general audience? So we have these public spaces for learning where we're looking at things like immersive experiences for children. We look at you know, the possibility for uh, 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 technologies to be pumped straight out into this environment. Here's one of my uh, favorite experiences. Uh, this is a, a, a girl, she's here, and she's using uh, this pen here to draw with virtual watercolors. And we have sensors sitting out here on the sides, uh, state of the art uh, from sensor fusion work that we did, uh, and the permanent magnet in here. And here you have virtual watercolors. And you can see on the screen what you're doing over here. Now, for kids, that's completely natural. No problem at all. They just pick up this thing, and they go digital, and they start. Uh, uh, and she's creating this wonderful stuff. Then the mother comes. The mother says, oh, I want to try this too. And the mother picks up the paintbrush. She goes there, and she picks up some color. It works fine. And after a while, it stops working. And when it stops working, the mother gets frustrated and she goes, oh, there's nothing, something's wrong with this installation, right? Then the daughter goes and she says, mom, you forgot the, uh, the virtual water that's over here, right? Because you need virtual water to pay to make virtual water cars. So it's, for the kids, this is completely natural and it's so wonderful to work with this generation. We also have a dome theater uh, seating about 100 people. Uh, and I'm going to show some things about the stuff that we're doing in this dome theater and how that can be used to create collaborative experiences and how you can take people to places that you otherwise could not go to and show them some amazing things. So um, here is the explanation of the, of the famous word. I invented this word, and my wife, she's American, she said, you cannot invent new words in English, it's impossible. Um, and there are too many syllables in it anyway. Uh, but I had to explain, in some sense, what it is, what is the essence of what we are doing at the Visualization Center, and I couldn't come up with anything better than exploration. Because here, here's my friend Anders. Uh, he's a radiologist. I've been sitting in his lab for 20 years, trying to figure out what it is that he wants to do with his medical data. Uh, we produce wonderful volumetric visualizations, 3D AI systems now to do pathology and all of that stuff. What, I, what we realized was that I could take exactly the same data, I could take exactly the same interaction paradigms, even the same computers, uh, thanks to the development of the GPU, and put it out in the public space. So this distance between Exploring and explaining is breaking down. I couldn't figure out a triangle to put that in, but it's sort of somehow it's breaking down, right? Uh, and, and this is something new that we haven't seen that much of before, that you can explore and explain using the same data, the same computers, the same visual representations. So we came up with the word exploration. 
Uh, and this is what I'm going to try to explain to you today, how that works and why we're doing it. Three circles at least, right? All right, okay. Now, there's the, the theory of science communication. There's the theory of data visualization. There's the theory of interactivity. And if you look at the intersections of these circles, you will find some really cool, interesting stuff. Uh, you will find that here some sort of explanatory visualization of some type that we do between data visualization and science communication. Here's another kind of explanatory visualization between interactivity and science communication. Here's the exploratory visualization that we do so much of in our community. And in the middle of this, you find the notion of the exploration. There are some challenges when we do this, of course. It doesn't happen by itself, you know? It's like rendering. We're so spoiled with the rendering, right? The kids out there, like, uh, these 200,000 kids that I have, they're so spoiled. They come in and they start interacting with one of my devices and, and, and they go, oh, it's lagging. Right? And I say, hey, <laughs> hit them in the head, right? This is 20 gigabytes of data you're looking at, right? But they don't understand that because they're really spoiled. Okay? This is a challenge. Right? Interaction. Anything that can break will break for you because people start interacting with it. They, they interact a little bit. If it doesn't work the way they expect it to work, they start hitting on it. And they hit on it until it breaks. It will break. Storytelling. This is one of those things that is so interesting, the whole domain of research in how do I tell stories interactively. And you will see a lot of examples of this here. And if I'm looking at kids, how do I make sure that someone who's completely free to explore actually reaches the learning goals, that I can have happy teachers coming with their school classes to me and say, hey, they actually learned what's specified in the syllabus. How can I do that if I'm free to explore, if I'm fully interactive? Those are the challenges that we deal with. So to be able to research this, we have a whole laboratory, a whole floor in our center that's called the Exploration Laboratory, where we have all kinds of interaction devices, uh, and we try out things, trying to break down that distance between the domain expert using visual representations and try to bring in a, a general public to try to explore and do research on the people who come there as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, to just give you a flavor of what it is that we're doing, and I'm going to step back in time a little bit. This is uh, a little bit of a non-linear story that I will uh, evolve in, in in a little while here. Now, if we step back a few years in time, this is the my CT scanner. Uh, I had the privilege of, of having my own CT scanner for many years, uh, and, uh, and it was continuously upgraded. So this is now a few years ago, but the data that comes out of these CT scanners um, is interesting in many ways, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the latest one we have now is a multispectral CT scanner, uh, amazing machine. Uh, but you can see the data that are coming out. It's like 25,000 slices for a patient in just two seconds. So you put the patient on that table, you accelerate, and you go through the hole out on the other side, and you have 25,000 slices in two seconds. You break before you hit the wall with the patient. It goes pretty fast. Right? So we can do stuff with this. And this has been the topic of research for so many years in our community. And we have contributed, many other groups have contributed uh, towards making it possible to improve the rendering quality, to make better and better, more interactive images, and try to exploit the possibilities that the computer hardware has been generating for us over the years. Uh, let me just bring up one, one of the latest examples that we did a few years back was the, the sort of photon uh, mapping work that we did, where we sort of started showering the data set and tried to do multiple scattering on that data. And just to bring you up to currency, what I'm going to show you in a little bit, uh, let me just show you what we're doing. We, we do the multiple scattering, we calculate the path of the photons, we do the mapping, um, we deal with the computational complexity. Uh, but we're also trying to minimize the footprint by keeping track of the photons. So as they're bouncing around through different parts of the tissue, depending on the transfer function, we're picking up color content, and we're trying to introduce something that we call the histogram, uh, which is keeping track of the transfer function footprint inside of, of the data. And it's, to some sense, only recompute when we need to recompute. So we're keeping track of what needs to be recomputed in each of those images. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that, you know, this is a few years ago. And what's happening now? Because now we have multispectral data. Uh, we have the possibility to do learning. So all of a sudden, five years ago, when we published this, we thought we were done. There was a sort of the final nail in the coffin, right? This is a done deal. We don't need to do more research on volumetric rendering. It's done. But now there are new challenges coming up. 
So keep an eye open for uh, the histograms that's going to be out there that's going to be applied to learning and spectral methods. So this is work, work in, in progress. But returning again to the, the topic of exploration, uh, let me show you this. Here's the sort of the state of the art where we are in terms of um, the volumetric rendering and the, uh, the time-dependent photo mapping that we've been doing. We got some honorable mentioning on the IEEE here a while ago. But look at this. Okay, so here it is. Um, so this is photon mapped. And it's a, it looks nice, right? It's a little video that I'm showing here. Now, if you should look at this in, in the context of the learning and the exploring and explaining, what is it that I really want to do with this image? It's not only showing the content of the actual image. What I really want to do is to show this. Because I want every single kid that comes to my visualization center to go back home and understand that these pretty images that I'm looking at at these installations is actually mathematics and programming behind it. So the volume rendering equation is there, right? And I want them to know that every time you touch that pixel, the GPU is solving this equation. Because you know, one thing, one challenge that we have in the world today is that the interest in mathematics, in programming, is going down. We have done measurements. I don't know what it's like in Austria, but in Sweden, we have done measurements on the interest for these topics among children. You look at the kids in the third grade. They're really keen on natural science, technology, programming, mathematics. And then you measure the same thing in ninth grade, and the interest has gone down. Among the boys, it goes like this. Right? And among the girls, it's gone. So this is one of the ways for us to communicate, hey, if you want to produce these wonderful, beautiful pictures, you have to actually look at some of these underlying mathematics and programming skills. And I'm going to show you many, many examples of that. Okay. Now, a few years ago, uh, we took all of these ideas and we, uh, we got our hands on, on uh, one of the first touch tables that came out. We're talking 2010 at this point. And we put that together with our volumetric rendering framework. We did some interface design. And, um, and all of a sudden, we had a new way of working with medical data. And we put out a little video on, on YouTube. And here it is. And, and people were just amazed by the fact that you could actually start interacting with medical data in this way. Uh, I know that some of you may have seen this before. But what I'm actually going to do is one of the scariest things that you can ever do, uh, which is showing something live. So let's see if I can do that. Let's see. OK, here we go. Here we go, there. Right. So thanks to Jensen Huang and his team, uh, I have an NVIDIA 3080 uh, in this laptop uh, and is running our volumetric rendering software at this point. And uh, I'm just going to bring up a few data sets here. So let's see. Let's see what I can do here. Come on. Whoops. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There we go. There. There. All right. OK, here. Uh, now, this is my friend Anders, right? the, the, the radiologist that I talked about. And if we're talking about digital twins, Eddie, uh, next time you come to Sweden, I'll scan you. Uh, then you have one uh, digital twin or yourself, just one for your body. I have, I have promised him that every time I do this, that I will turn him this way. No, not that way, that way. Uh, 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 so that when I peel off the layers, okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, but what you can see is that I have so much simplified the interfaces here, so it's so easy to change. What I'm doing is I'm changing the transfer function. And I want the kids, I want the people that come, I want them to understand that, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on in that equation that you just saw. And I'm solving that millions of times per second on the GPU to make this possible to rotate things around. Okay? Now, um, what I'm also going to do is to show Anders' skeleton. Okay. Okay. I'm going to zoom in on this. There's so many stories to tell in this interactive media. Look at this here. Um, here's his shoe. Here you can start talking about x-rays. What is an x-ray? Here you can see the, uh, uh, the shoe has the steel down here, and the, the, the shoelaces are going through. And, and you know, the kids, when, when you show them this and you tell, uh, guess what this is right up here? And they say, oh, that's a zipper in the jeans. Then they start laughing hysterically because they think that's funny. <laughs> there we go. But you know, one thing. If you, if you think that you're healthy, don't put yourself in one of these scanners. <laughs> Anders has said, I'm 60 years old. I, I can take some radiation. It doesn't matter. Um, but he didn't know that he had some serious case of scoliosis. Look at his back right there. And a ruptured disc as well. So whatever you do, don't put yourself in the scanner. And you talk about your reconstruction artifacts. Let me, let me show you just one or two more data sets here. 
Um, you see, I have, I have, we scan everything that you can scan. So if you have anything that, anything with interesting content, just send it to us. We'll scan it for you. Um, uh, so let me bring up. Um, oh, this one's one of my favorites. Okay. Now look at this one. This is um, a little piece of amber from the Natural History Museum in London, and it can. Uh, inside of that is a small gecko lizard. It's 20 million years old. So this is before we had humans on our planet. 20 million years. And I can just, you know, when you look at it at the museum, it looks like a piece of rock. But here I can peel it off and I can bring out the lizard. There it is. I can look at the bone structure and you can see that everything is basically decomposed. The, the tissue is decomposed. So it's just a, and then you ask, how, how can you actually visualize the, the lizard if, you, if everything is gone? Well, it's just a minus sign in the equation. So what I'm doing is just doing the negative on the transfer function and I'm visualizing the imprint. All right, one more before we continue. This one. Okay. Here, a stingray. It looks like a fish, right? And peeling off some layers. Now look at this. Here's the skeleton of a stingray. It's a piece of art. And, and this is this, this sort of sense of wonder that you can generate by showing some amazing content. You can generate so much interest. And this is where visualization and graphics has such an important role to play, is that we can show the beauty, not only the science, but also the beauty of science. Right. Let me go back. So uh, we got a lot of attention on this, and I'm not going to say too, too much about it. My, my wife, she's, she's, she's going to show up here in a little while, uh, but she's a social scientist, and they said, now you have finally done something that's okay, because they've written about you in The Economist. Uh, that, that's her only measure of success, is The Economist. Right? So, but what happened was that we, we started working with uh, some companies here and we put out something that we call the medical visualization table uh, and it gained a lot of momentum. And at this point, uh, we have about 10,000 tables in 50 countries uh, to do primarily teaching of medical students uh, to do whole body visualization work on, on that. But to go back to this story, I don't know if you're into royalty since in Europe, but this is the Swedish crown princess uh, and, and Prince Daniel. He, he, uh, this, this is not recorded, right? Okay. Oh, no. Uh, so he, uh, he was her personal trainer uh, and they got married. And, and here's Anders, that you just saw him naked. Um, <laughs> and, here, and here's Thomas, my student, who did a lot of the work as well. Uh, and this is at the expo in, in Shanghai when we, we showed it. And this was sort of the starting point for working with museums. So, so this is the sort of the, the, the migration from very, very basic volumetric rendering and search uh, through some company work and, and all the way out to the museums. So here's the British Museum. I'm sort of envious of them because they have 8 million visitors per year. Uh, and they have a number of artifacts. They have the Rosetta Stone that I'm sure you've heard about, you know, the, translating the hieroglyphs. Um, but they also have this guy. Uh, this is the Gebelin Man. Uh, he's a 5,500-year-old mummy. Uh, and he was found in southern Egypt, close to the border to Sudan. And, um, uh, and we transported him to one of the hospitals. They hadn't, didn't have a clue what happened to him. How did he die? How did he end up in the sand down there? He's sort of a natural mummification, not mummified as they do, did later on in Egypt, but just a natural mummy. Uh, and so we took him to one of the scanners in London. Not as good as my scanner, uh, but we used that one. Um, and, and here... Here's the first exploration session for uh, the people at the British Museum. Now, here's some really, really, really important people. Uh, this guy here is Neil Spencer. He's the Egyptology guy at, at the museum, a whisk uh, This one here is Daniel Antoine. Uh, he has the most amazing title. Uh, he's a physical anthropologist, head of human remains. He's, he, he's, he's, he's the mummy guy. He's the one with this here. Okay. So, so what do we do? And let me just show you that. So what do we do? Okay, let's see. Now, as I promised, there will be lots of demos, and hopefully the system will be with me. We'll see. Okay, there we go. There, okay. There, okay. Now, thanks to the British Museum, I bring you the Gibbelay Man. Here he is. Okay, 5,500 years. They didn't have a clue what had happened to the Gebelin man. So here's a fold in the shoulder. Look at this here. And Daniel and his friends, they had been staring at that fold for 15 years, thinking, could this be something that could have to do with the way that this sort of 20-year-old man died? 
And of course, what we can do is that we can cut plane and we can look at it. this. Mummies are difficult to visualize because it's almost entirely made up of dried human tissue. And setting the transfer function for this is terrible. It's really hard. Uh, so it's just mostly red and brown. Uh, you can see some dry human tissue inside and, uh, and all of this right here. But uh, to look at the that damage there, let's uh, rotate a bit like this. There you go. Turns out that Gebelin man was actually stabbed in the back because there's the broken rib cage. We even found a knife that fits the wound. It was lying next to him. So we found a 5,500 year old cold murder case. We found the murder weapon, but the murder is still free. <laughs> so, of course, again, we m made some news on this. I, I love this one here, like murder at the British Museum. <laughs> Which was pretty funny. But this brings me to, again, let's reflect over this notion of exploring and explaining. Because we put this out there in the British Museum. Actually, if you go there now, uh, to Gallery 64, uh, our business session is there. Uh, and what did we do? What, how did we make that work? I don't know if you noticed that when I showed some of the things, that we really had some design principles under, underlying this. That all the time the object is in the focus. We never lose. When you visualize, when you interact, this sort of the notion of immersion, of attachment to the object that we're looking at is always there. You never lose that. There's no pop-up menu, nothing that's disturbing you in your session when you're looking at the object because the notion of some physical artifacts inside of this box should be there. Um, the interaction is very, very minimal. But we release the freedom. When you zoom in on something, we increase the, the freedom in terms of interaction. Because if you let people rotate in any direction, they get lost. So rotation is very limited when you're at the global scale. But when at your micro scale, we limit the interaction. And of course, because there are so many kids, uh, actually you will see in, in just a while, the utilization of this particular installation is basically all of the opening hours someone's there. And many people at the same time. So we're trying to limit the, the, the multi-user interaction. The, the transfer functions, they're horrendously complicated. How many of you have worked with transfer function editors? All right, me too, okay. They're horrendously complicated and difficult. So what we have done is just to simplify that with a number of presets and sort of make it sort of a natural progression of sliding across so that you get the notion that you're peeling layers after layers off from the object, but still get the notion that you're not. It's not a different model, it's the same data, it's just that I'm changing the settings in the transfer function. That's very important to convey that. The narrative, uh, I didn't show that, but uh, you can have these little information spots. You can just bring up, the, you know, read about things and sort of give a hint to where am I going to explore next. But it's so minimal that it doesn't really disturb you in, in the context of the visualization. Now, uh, this is a horrible slide, I, I apologize, there's so much stuff on it. Now, uh, we did a survey. There was one poor, one poor employee at the museum was sitting there in the gallery for six months uh, and just writing down by hand every single user who was there and, and, uh, and did statistics on what did they do. Because the fear, the ultimate fear, if you talk to a museum curator, the ultimate fear is that any digital installation will distract attention away from the physical object or artifact. Right? Their fear. Now, what we showed was that the, the time that people spent in the gallery increased by 40% when we put the table in there. What we also showed uh, was that uh, the fraction of visitors who actually looked at the physical display increased from 59 to 83 because they got curious. They did a virtual exploration and then they stopped by and looked at the real mummy as well. And the thing that really made them turn it into a, a physical uh, um, installation there, long-term wise, was that 60% of the users discovered the cause of death. So a whole new level of understanding and appreciation of this rare artifact that they had, or subject that they had at the museum. So it's there. Um, if you want to read more about the, this particular experience that we had, it's, uh, it's one of the cover features in, in the uh, ACM, uh, December 2016. Uh, uh, and there's a lot, a lot of experiences drawn from this particular work that we did there. And if you photo mapped Gebelin Man, he looks like this. Now, but for me, for me, the value is not in that publication in the ACM. The value for me as a researcher, the most rewarding thing for me is to know 
that out there in hundreds of different zoo museums worldwide, kids are using my algorithms every day. And, and that's sort of the incentive, I think, for the whole community to go in this direction, start doing these things, start communicating, because it's such a great thing to do. You can have impact scientifically, you can have impact with companies, but this public domain is so important for the next generation that we have. Okay. Now, how am I doing on time? <laughs> do you want to see the biggest brain in the world? All right. So I just want to go beyond medical CT. Okay, now let, let's do that really quickly. Now this is a, a little bit of a scary thing to do because uh, if I, I really had to uh, to quit this thing to be able to do that. Let's see if I can there. Okay, there. I'll bring it up again. Bear with me for a second. I I'm known to have failed uh, demonstrations in presentations. Just so you know. Let's see a little bit there. Cancel. And there, that one. Okay, it worked. Thank you. Now, I gave a talk yesterday, and I talked about artificial intelligence. And uh, and one of the conclusions that came out of a panel debate that we had is that yeah, ChatGPT, yeah, it's great, but are we really taking s steps towards truly intelligent system? Oh, maybe. But we're sort of searching for inspiration on the uh, on the anatomical side as well. So let's uh, let's look at this big brain here. Okay, here it is. Um, it looks pretty cool. Okay, it's down sampled at this level. The color isn't that great on the transfer function. Apologies for that. Uh, but here you can see some of these information tags, right? So this is the way that we tell stories with the software. Uh, let me just bring in the brain color a little bit here. Okay, if I can, there, okay. And uh, let's show you this area here where I have even higher resolution. We're going to go down to 25 microns in resolution, but I can't do that in the whole brain at the same time, even though it's been scanned with synchrotron radiation, uh, basically like x-rays with extreme energy. Uh, this is uh, a, a patient, a woman, 69 year old, uh, she died of COVID, uh, so you can't do this to living people, of course. Uh, so it's with great respect uh, to this woman that died during these tragic circumstances, but uh, the brain is interesting to scan. So let's look at it. Okay, so there we go in, there's the local scan. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in on that, okay? There. This, remember, this is just one huge data set of the brain. Uh, and we're going to go in, I'm going to look at, here it comes at some of the, uh, the blood vessels, and the next level. Okay, let's zoom out a bit. There. And there. The next level. And the next level. And the blood vessels. Now we're down to individual neurons. This is the network of neurons in the brain. We have about 80 billion neurons in the brain. And these are the blood vessels that are going to individual neurons at this point, which is pretty cool. All right. I just wanted to show you that. <laughs> so where are we heading? Well, we're heading towards some sort of theoretical understanding of this notion of exploring and explaining. And um, this group that I have, Conrad Schoenborn, who's a professor um, in pedagogics and didactics, he's sort of come up with a theoretical framework for the learning process, the scaffolding that happens. How do you, how do you extract knowledge from visual representations? Uh, and in this particular bubble here, he's working a lot and how we go around this sort of virtual cycle of uh, of uh, interactions, of development, and meaning making, construct knowledge, visual language, cognition, and the engine of this whole thing is visualization in a new way that we haven't really thought about in the past. This uh, brings me to this notion of learning. Uh, and I couldn't resist, I, I just had to put in a, a few slides on the perspectives on learning. Uh, and uh, how many of you have not tried ChatGPT? All right, that's a few. Go, go home and do it, it's fun. Yeah. Now, we have seen such an amazing development uh, over the past uh, just few months now with generative models in AI. This is where I spend a lot of my cycles right now is to, to work on making, making these things possible. Uh, playing around with TensorFlow, here's Dali. Uh, you, I mean, uh, you can just generate anything. Here's this, the city hall in Stockholm. I just said, give me a Dali image. It comes out just like that. Yeah. And ChatGPT is, of course, doing, doing amazing things. So uh, just as an example, uh, uh, people who went to Eurographics in 2010 know that I'm a fan of ABBA. <laughs> so I, I asked ChatGPT to write an ABBA-like song about Vienna. 
and and here it is, right? So now you have to you have to think Dancing Queen here now. So shh, and, like, and and sing this song Vienna, oh Vienna, city of music and art, where the streets are lined with history and the coffee shops are at work of heart. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And it goes on Vienna, Vienna, you steal my heart away. Vienna, Vienna, I'll come back to you one day. Right? That's, that's fantastic, right? So, but. What we're doing, and, and this is actually a picture taken yesterday, I believe. <laughs> that's, that's one of the worst pictures of me ever, I think. But so we just installed our new uh, supercomputer, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is uh, one of the reasons why I'm a little bit late coming in here yesterday. Uh, and this is the machine that will support the Swedish version of uh, ChatGPT, sort of a very tailored language towards Swedish. Uh, and it's the GPT-3 model that we're basing this on. Uh, and we're going to train that with 175 billion parameters, which is going to be one of the largest models of languages in the world at this point. And it's going to take us these 94 nodes, each with eight GPUs, uh, and an amazing network, 80 gigabytes of memory for each of the nodes, is going to take us about nine months on the full machine. Uh, and, uh, and it's thanks to... Uh, one of the big founding organizations in Sweden that we, that we can do this. It's also going to be used for other small applications like protein folding and vision and material science. But the language model is the important thing, right? Okay, now, so, so where am I heading? And this is where I'm connecting to, uh, to what Eddie talked about as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's the sort of way of exploring and explaining because you, know, you, you come to a, a science center and and this notion of understanding and getting a wow feeling, this is really cool what I'm, what I'm experiencing. The notion of the wow is very much based on who you meet. If you meet someone, a knowledgeable person, someone who can tell you a story, that's important. Okay. So what we're doing now is that we are trying to make use of these amazing advantages on generative models to say, hey, let's put together some uh, 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 text-to-speech systems, some uh, automatic uh, speech recognition and some NLP uh, generative uh, with intent on, on slotting and feed that into the uh, Tokyo avatar generator and see if we can produce something that's a virtual guide. And, and, and those of you who are familiar with this realize that this is all NVIDIA stuff. And we were very, very pleased to have the CEO of NVIDIA with us yesterday uh, to support this project. So, uh, you know, the only thing here between the two of us here, I, I reflected over this image yesterday and I, and, I, and I counted the number of zeros in difference in salary between the two of us. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of them. Uh, uh, but he's a, he's a really cool guy in many ways. So finally, finally, maybe we can get towards, this is a vision that I had a few years ago when I said, we need to be able to explore and explain and we need to have this sort of human style interaction to our visitors coming in. I said, this is uh, the light stage uh, uh, work, or the light field display that some of my people did together with Paul Debevec in, at the Institute for Creative Technologies just before he left from there. Uh, and you know, having this sort of human style conversation uh, about content, about the visualization, this is where I see ourselves going in terms of the public spaces. Being able to sit down and have a chat with someone who is knowledgeable and trained to give you the, the right answers. And I think this will be extremely cool to be able to do that. All right. I promised in my abstract that I would talk about space. I will do that. <laughs> Open Space is a project um, that we have been running for a, a few years, and it's sort of based on a vision. Uh, and I apologize that I'm going to show pictures of myself here today, uh, um, but I couldn't resist. This is my grandmother's television. Uh, the year is 1969. And guess what happened in 1969? The landing on the moon, right? And guess how old I was? Six, six years old. So I was sitting in front of this television set and I was watching the landing on the moon. Uh, and it was this amazing moment in, in my own development and my interest for science, technology, physics, astronomy, uh, to the point that I decided to become an astronaut. <laughs> Uh, and this is me, Christmas Eve, 1969. Uh, I got a space helmet. I refused to take it off. For, um, they had to feed me sandwiches through the visor here. That was the only way. Uh, my brother was going to become an ice hockey player here. That was the, the division between the two of us in many ways. So I tried to become an astronaut. M many of you know that. And I uh, failed miserably at that. Uh, but, but then a few years after that, I got the chance to work together with some of my friends over at the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And we came up with this vision uh, to browse the universe. Uh, and uh, to do that, 
to contextualize space missions, observations, simulations, uh, to do that with high quality graphics, scalable systems, dome theaters, laptops, uh, interact with space and sort of this digital twin of the universe that we wanted to have, um, and to explore and explain science communication and research at the same time, and it should be open source. So if you're a space nerd and you haven't tried open space, just download it and run it on your laptop or whatever you have, uh, and you can fly through space, and it's pretty cool. There are some challenges with spatial temporal scales, variety in size of data, um, the immersive experiences, but primarily also the flexibility and robustness, because again, anything that can break will break if you put it out in the public domain. Now, the partners that we have is the Goddess Place Flight Center, there's the museum in New York, there's us in Norrköping, the Ski Institute in Utah, and NYU in New York are working together, and a number of planetariums uh, worldwide. California Academy up there, we have Denver, we have New York, and sadly, 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 what's happening here? Oh, man, this is too bad. Yeah. You need support, Gavi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. But uh, here's the team of people that did, did that made it possible, and I always want to show their faces because these are so many talented students that have been working in open space. These are the master students that have been working over the past six years on the, on the project. And some of the people that you may know from the, from the VIS community, Chuck Hansen from Utah, for instance, there, and Claudio Silva from, from NYU. Uh, but what we do, we do a lot of stuff, and I'm not going to show you all of these things that we do, but we do a lot of stuff with open space uh, and uh, everything ranging from digitalization of space missions to flying out to the end of the universe. Uh, we contextualize volumetric data. We can look at simulations of the sun, coronal mass ejections. We do all of that kind of stuff. And we do it in dome theaters. Uh, and we do it interactively. So it's interactive stories in dome theaters that we're doing. That's the main thing for open space. Again, to explore and explain, but it's a collaborative exploration session that we are enabling. So one of the things that, we, uh, that, that I'm very proud of is this uh, best paper award that we got in 2017 for our system to, glob, uh, to browse planetary surfaces. Uh, and it's, it's really a data structure that is retrieving online data from a number of different repositories and pasting it in so we can create these sort of immersive experiences of planetary surfaces. Uh, and to save some time, uh, dim the lights a little bit for me. Okay, and here. Now it's not interactive, but I wanted to show you just how, how wonderful and how you can get immersed inside of this. Look, here's, the, here's Mars. Uh, this is just captured directly from, uh, from open space, on, from, from the GPU, and we're zooming in. And you can see there's one particular part of the Martian surface called the Valles Marineris. It's sort of the Grand Canyon of, of Mars. This is where we're heading now. We have physically based rendering of the Martian atmosphere that we're coming into at this point. Um, uh, Mount Olympus, the tallest mountain in, uh, in the solar system, was a little bit further to the right over there. And we have recreated the uh, surface terrain with data from the MRO, or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with a resolution of about six meters. And uh, we're going down into one particular part of the Valles Marineris called the Candrocusma, and the southwestern part of that. Down here, we're going down all the way down to the surface of, this, uh, of Mars, and down here is one particular patch where we have data from the high-rise instrument with 25 centimeter resolution. So seamlessly, all the way from the Big Bang, you can go down to 25 centimeters on the Martian surface. Uh, and you can fly over these uh, sand dunes that are 25 to 50 meters in altitude. And you can do that in full 3D, uh, 8K stereo in our dome theater, and you feel as if you're really there. And if Matt Damon was there, I promise you would see him. Right? But it's also the notion of being able to explore. I always tell people when I show this is that we are the first ones to explore this because it's interactive graphics. No one has ever seen these images before you. We are the first ones to explore and explain about the Martian surface. And then you want to listen to David Bowie as well, you know, life on Mars and all of that. So again, it's not only science, it's also beautiful. But going full circle again, back to the scientific community, what use do they have out of dome theaters? Look here. These are 100 astronomers 
they're looking at the, the Gaia data set. Uh, just a few weeks after they released the Gaia data set, the, the most accurate data set that we have so far of our galaxy. They're looking at that, and they can see the trace. They can even see the pattern of the sensor on, uh, on the spacecraft, and they can see the spacecraft. And many of the astronomers here were like, wow, now I understand what visualization is good for. Because astronomers have been skeptics when it comes to visual representations. But these guys, they were saved. So I wish that we could have been in the dome and we could have shown you some of this. I wish we could have been in the Vienna dome uh, to show you some of these things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but in Sweden, on the other hand, uh, this is the starting point for a big journey. And I'm going to spend my last minutes showing you what's happening. Because of the, the stuff that we have done in combining domain research with visualization, with creative storytelling, because we have done that, big things are happening. Uh, so we have a huge donation called the WIST Dome, the Wallenberg Immersive Science Communication Domes. And based on the dome that we have in Norrköping, there's one that has been constructed up north in Umeå. There's one that's been cons constructed in Stockholm, one down in Malmö in the south, and one in Gothenburg. And just to give you the feeling for how big they are, this is the Gothenburg Dome here that we're putting up. We're sort of changing the whole city in Gothenburg based on this. And it's all because of visualization, right? Isn't that cool? So... Uh, we have made productions for this, and this is uh, sort of taking me to the next level. We, we've made productions for these dome theaters. One is, is called Stort, that's vast in, in Swedish. It, it's the journey to the end of the universe and back again. Okay. Here's another story. Here we're taking the trick of uh, basically telling the story about how you make computer games and, and how you make visual effects. And we made this dome production, an immersive 8K, 60 frames per second stereo rendering. And I came up with this idea. Let's tell them everything that you get to know in your computer graphics 101 course. We tell them that in the dome. And we tell them to six-year-olds. Um, uh, and we do that. We show them everything, right? The, the only requirement I had when we made the movie, the, only, the, the people down at the public center, it's, it's a company, right? They said that we have only one uh, requirement here. Uh, that has to be a dinosaur. So I thought, why not tell the story about how you make a dinosaur? Uh, so this is the dinosaur story, how you use physics, mathematics, programming, design, art, storytelling. And, you know, Eddie, they don't like triangles. <laughs> it's quads. <laughs> quads. <laughs> and everyone gets an adrenaline kick, even old people, when the dinosaur jumps out and bites you in your head. Uh, and it does that towards the end. You know, even to the point when we said we had to put a, a, an age limit, a lower age limit on uh, how old you have to be to actually see the show. So we said six. I'm now considering putting an upper age limit uh, because I'm afraid that we might have someone with a heart attack. <laughs> Uh, one production on AI is coming out. If you have any ideas on how to tell a story about AI, let me know because I'm in production of that. Uh, one story is Chemistry of Life. And chemistry of life was such an amazingly difficult problem that I have to talk to Ivan Viola. Uh, and Ivan's sitting somewhere here, right? There he is, right? And I had to talk to uh, Tobias, Peter, and Eddie as well uh, at the nanographics team. But also primarily to Drew Berry. And some of you may know who Drew Berry is. He's the famous Australian animator. He's the one that all of the stuff that you see on, on the YouTube out there with some cool stuff on... Um, flying into the cell, very nice animations. He's been doing that for many years. But he bases his stories on hundreds and hundreds of research papers. Uh, and he's a really great guy to work with. So we put together this team, us in North Shipping, uh, Ivan's team, and uh, Andrew Berry. And said, let's make it a dome production about this. And here's one of the first renderings that came out. Uh, and it's all about the mitochondria. It's sort of the, the, the engines of life. And here, here you go. So here, here you have negative charges, positive charges. You have a membrane. And uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the fuel of the human body. Uh, you have 10 grams of ATP in your body right now, and you consume one gram per second. So if these guys stop working, you have 10 seconds of life. Uh, and just imagine that this is happening inside of your body, billions and billions and billions of them. Every single neuron that you have in your brain is consuming about 4.8 billion of these per second. This is what it looks like if you uh, render that in 8K stereo in 60 frames per second fish. Can you dim the lights again so you can see the contrast in this? And just these sort of, it, you're sort of tempted to think of this as some sort of mechanical motor that's going on inside of your body. But every single life form has these 
uh, ATP synthase uh, going on inside of you. And this is the story that we're telling in this show. And uh, this is actually a, a little video from, uh, from Montreal uh, just uh, a few months ago. And uh, Mons here is our animator. Uh, and we were, this is a terrible dome uh, that they had. Look at the projectors up there, right? They're shiny right through the hole. But, uh, but this is just to give you a notion of the immersion uh, of how you actually feel like you're actually inside of the human, human cell and all of these molecules that you fill up with. And here is where we have the desire to now work on the storytelling and do more of the work like Eddie's talking about uh, with Ivan and go interactive uh, and not do render stories, but interactive stories, yeah, just like we do with open space. Speaking of that, uh, just as a final uh, wrap up here, uh, let, let me say a few words about when we're down to that sort of scale, let's talk a little bit about the, the stuff that we've been doing at the, at the very lowest level. Uh, and this is cryo-EM, um, where we have been looking at really, really high resolution cryo-EM data coming out from the, uh, the, the Science for Life laboratory in Stockholm and helping out to do the visual tools for the modeling uh, of, uh, of that kind of data. It's really, really hard. Most of the stuff that we know about these protein, complex proteins is wrong. Well, not most of it, but much is wrong because the model validation is so hard. So any kind of visual tool that can help these guys to do validation is important. So Martin Falk, one of my uh, um, junior lecturers, has been spending a lot of time developing tools to help these researchers to do that. But, you know, as a consequence of this, uh, that we're doing all this work to develop uh, tools for the, the domain scientists is also that we get access to data. Uh, and as my f final uh, demonstration today, I'm going to show you our Corona exhibition. It's a very bad way of ending, ending a talk, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, so here we go. Have to go back there first. Okay. This one's not so happy anymore. There. There. Okay. So again, in the collaboration with Nanographics, we, uh, we got the, the Corona model, so that's now in, in the same sort of explanation uh, context that we have, so you can explore and explain, uh, you can read about the content here, about the membranes, uh, you can of course cut it open, and look at it, look at the RNA on the inside, and everything like that. But uh, Ivan and his team can show you a much prettier version of this. What I'm going to show you is, is how you can actually uh, take the level to go down to the cryo-EM data that we got from our collaborators that we provided with the tools, and this is the spike protein. This is the guy that makes it life hard for us. Uh, the one that has the, the receptors that opens up the membranes and makes it possible to go inside and, and the three components in that that contains the key to get into, in particular, human fat cells, three proteins working together. Uh, and also the key to understanding uh, about how to develop the vaccines. Now, so again, in, in terms of storytelling, you tell the story about the virus, you tell the story about the spike protein, but what does it do? Let's see. Again, uh, with respect for people uh, who we have scanned, this is a patient from Brazil, 73-year-old male, uh, and here's his chest. And you know, again, you can see it's fully interactive. Um, think about the rendering equation now. You think if you think this is not so nice to look at, um, uh, and let me just cut him open on the side a little bit there. Okay. So let's look at his lung. Uh, this is October 2019, uh, and then he contracted the, the virus uh, in May. So this is pretty healthy here now. You can see the liver is a little bit enlarged here, but it's relatively, relatively healthy. Uh, on the 9th of May in 2020, he contracted the virus. So, so here you can see the onset of, uh, of corona going on here. You have fluid ac accumulation. Uh, wrong one. <laughs> you have fluid accumulation down here uh, and some inflammation going on inside of the body. Now. And I know that this is a very, very serious topic, but it's so interesting from a storytelling and from a scientific perspective. But let me just go uh, three days forward in time. Look at that. So this is the full storm that's going on inside of his body. Um, uh, even necrosis on some of the tissue, uh, and you know, the, the, the fraction of the lung that's actually functioning is uh, getting less and less. So, so you can see that he is uh, getting oxygen at this point. And uh, you can also see that uh, then it's being put under. So here's the 5th of June, 
essentially nothing left of the lung. This is all that's left to help help you breathe. But uh, miraculously enough, uh, after a month of being put under, it's beginning to recover. But you know, he was put under for about a month, and I should say um, that. Uh, very sadly, uh, he did not survive. So a few months after this, from the complications, he actually passed away. But what we also did was that we said, okay, let's tell these stories because it's it create the awareness of the virus, how it works, and what kind of effect it has on the human body, but also on the global scale. So here's a very, very simple uh, visualization of the pandemic from a global perspective in the context. But you can see the progression of the story going from, from the scientific details, from the microscopic to the macroscopic, and you can follow all of these events. Let's see if something happened here. We can see if we can find the Austrian event here. Here somewhere. Okay. Now that's the Italian. Yeah. But anyway. All right. And as I said, uh, we're very grateful to the collaborators in this uh, nanographics. We have um, uh, the Brazilian uh, partners. We have the Sci Life Lab in Stockholm and our own work in, in Mo Shipping to, to develop these things. Right. So I hope that I have shown you that what we're facing here is the possibility to maybe do science communication in a new way and that we can have a huge impact uh, on society. If we take research results, if we put them together with the public engagement, and if we combine that with visualization research, we have a wonderful opportunity to do some great stuff that can affect uh, both the researchers, but uh, primarily reach out there and generate all of these interesting uh, side effects on the way. So here's the triangle, finally, towards the end. Right. Only thing that remains for me is to say that I'm the proud representative of so many people's work. Uh, and here's just a few of the names and the partners that we have in, in this work. Um, they are extremely talented, smart people, and uh, I'm so, so grateful for their efforts. And here are some more names that have been working on the space stuff that you saw as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Anders, for uh, this great talk. Um, before uh, we start with uh, questions, I have an announcement to make. Um, we have afterwards the Via Vis um, Award, and we will hear uh, two uh, more inspiring talks. So um, if you please stay here, uh, we don't have a break in, in between. So um, there's there's uh, no, no more coffee break. Um, <laughs> so, um, do you have any questions um, about the talk? We have one, one question here. It's about visual learning and communication. You mm. said 200,000 guests, mm. mainly children, come through. I was yeah. wondering, on one of your diagrams, you had the word stroke. Right. Do you have any work on people with language disorders, aphasia following a stroke? coming to your institute, that would be very interesting to see how visualization can be used in, yeah, in their yeah. therapy process. Right. Um, uh, and I think it connects to, uh, uh, to Ming's talk as well. Uh, we had a, a project with stroke rehabilitation using haptics uh, that we ran for a couple of years. It's no longer there now, but we did some evaluation studies on problem solving to regain some sort of muscle memory and how you actually work with things uh, using haptic devices. Um, uh, we have one project where we're looking at visualization for the blind, which is, I think is actually quite interesting as well, uh, and how tactile uh, uh, representations can actually augment some of that, those experiences. So yeah, we, we're doing a little bit of work on that. Not as pronounced now. I mean, it, it all comes with the funding, right? So we had funding for that for a couple of years, but uh, right, right now we're, we're not doing as much of that. Yeah. Amazing stroke you had there, that you had a lesion that was being shown, or...? What was behind? You had showed us aging. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, you mean, yeah, what yeah, was the yeah. stroke? Um, okay. Uh, uh, it was actually just a potential stroke patient that I had there. Uh, so it was, uh, I, I can bring it up. I, I'll do it after the session, right? Uh, uh, it's a patient, and uh, she was scanned for another reason, and they found an aneurysm in the brain. Uh, and they actually went in and fixed that, so we can, we can visualize where the, the clip is sitting around that particular vessel to tighten it up. Yeah. But so it was a potential aneurysm, yeah. 
do we have some more questions? Yeah, thanks. That's really wonderful work. And I think educating people is something very mm. important mm. in these times, especially. Um, I mean, what we observe is that there is always little money for these kinds of things. Mm. So do you have recommendations for Austria <laughs> to, to change on that? Or how do you... I mean, I, I, I see you have... A, potential funders behind that, which mm. just donate money, I guess. And uh, so is, are there proposals how to bring that up in a better way? I should all move to Sweden and join me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, but I think it's, it's uh, catching this opportunity that we're seeing now. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, I really like Eddie's uh, future look in terms of where are we heading and the role that we have to play uh, in terms of providing information, knowledge curation, uh, visual literacy, and all of that. I mean, it's a mission that we have. Uh, and, uh, and without that mission, you know, society is, is not going to be sustainable in the future. So I, I'm sort of pitching, I'm pitching our work as something that is entirely needed and is enabling the transformation that society is going through from from a mindset point of view in the population, but also in real actions and how we can solve, try to solve some of those issues that we are facing in the world. So I think addressing, putting yourself forward as a, a key component in that process in meeting the global challenges that we're seeing, I think is one of, one of the keys. And for me, the particular global challenge that I see here, I mean, the, the Wallenberg cousins, there is, is, uh, we have an, an amazing setup in Sweden. We have, it's the fifth generation of uh, of this family that own, they own small companies like Saab, uh, like you know they have their own bank and Volvo and all of that. So, so but in that in, as in the um, uh, uh, in the bylaws of that foundation, it says that they have to fund research uh, using based on the revenue that they're getting out. Uh, and uh, and this family is then helping us. But, but what they see is that they have the perspective that unless we raise the level of knowledge in the population in Sweden, we are not going to be able to compete with the rest of the world. Marcus Wallenberg, every time he's been to China, he gives me another billion kroners because he's afraid of, of the Chinese competition. Yeah. Okay, so it's a lot yeah. of political work. It's a lot, think, a lot of a lot of political work. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I downed you with the Corona thing no, here at the, at the no. very end, but, but I thought <laughs> it was important to, to, to show you that as well. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. great work. Right. Thank you. Okay, some more questions. Uh, thanks for the really inspiring, great talk. Um, talking about kids, I mean, uh, uh, how do you deal with the museum exhibitions? Because uh, what I usually see in those exhibitions is there is if there is such an exhibit, it's great. But then there is uh, always a queue, and then there's the two kids who were there for twenty minutes, and there's actually your own kids never get the chance to play around with it. Mm. And it's it's kind of frustrating if this there's this one cool exhibit and uh, there's no chance to actually get at it in in a real life situation when you go there at the weekend and uh, everybody's there and um, mm. just frustrating in the end. In yeah. way. You know, a, uh, Sweden is a sparsely populated country, right? So <laughs> <laughs> so we we don't have that issue that to that extent. Uh, but but we did encounter that problem when we worked with the British Museum and and they said it can't be too good because then we'll end up in this problem. Uh, so, so they actually introduced the timer on the system when they said, like, you know, it sort of flash it up, you know, time, time out, so that you know, people would move on. And also, if you have traveling exhibits, you know, they have to pump through to recover the cost of a traveling exhibit. Uh, they have to pump through people like continuously. So, uh, so we we simplified, we took away, we simplified, and just you can you can basically walk through and still get some sort of mediated experience that way. So yeah, it's there. Yeah. 